Hey, it's Rowan. Just a very quick bit of context before we dive into the video. So last year I was contacted by a publisher, Stripes, saying, hey, would you like um, an advanced copy of this book that we're publishing? And I was like, cool, what's it about? And they were like, oh, it's just LGBTQ plus anthology series um, with short stories and illustrations by British uh, LGBTQ plus writers and illustrators. And I was like, get it in my eyeballs right now, please. Uh, and then obviously devoured it, adored it, um, got asked to write a quote for the cover. Uh, and then they were like, hey, do you want to maybe like interview Juno Dawson and like maybe one of the writers and illustrators of the book uh, for a video or something on your channel? And I was like, yes, 100% yes. So that is essentially what you're about to watch. We did it at Gaze the Word, which is this amazing LGBTQ plus uh, bookstore in London. It is an amazing historical site for our community. I will leave some details in the description as well if you want to check it out. Uh, so yeah, basically we just had these lovely chill chats about representation and writing LGBT characters and the stories that aren't being told yet, uh, coming out narratives, just a load of stuff. Uh, and then we bought a lot of books from Gaze the Word afterwards. So, you know, had a really brilliant time doing this video. Because this is an entirely queer anthology, it means it isn't like a queer story that's had to be shoehorned into other short stories, and it doesn't have to be one story that represents the whole of our community. This is a load of stories telling lots of different people's narratives. It's got poetry, it's got coming out narratives, it's got mythology, it's got um, one of my favourites, which is uh, Someone on the Run. Uh, I don't want to say any more about it, I don't want to spoil it, but it's great. Um, so yeah, if that seems up your street, and honestly, if you're subscribed to me, this 100% is up your street. Give it a go, there's a link in the description of somewhere you can purchase it. Uh, so yeah, on with these interviews uh, with Juno Simon and Alice. So I'm here with Alice and Simon, who are responsible for one of the stories in the book, um, and we're just gonna have a little chat. We have a little chat about it. So if we're talking about like writing kind of LGBT books or stories with those characters, um, was that something that you were drawn to like from the very start when you first started writing, or is it something that you've come to later and come to appreciate a bit later on? I feel like for me, it did sort of grow from when I wrote my first book, Solitaire, because um, <laughs> when I wrote Solitaire, obviously, I thought I was straight, for example, <laughs> um, and it just wasn't something that was at the front of my mind. And a lot of the YA that I was reading had no LGBT characters. Mm. Like this was in, when I was reading YA and coming up with Solitaire, it was like 2012. And most YA was like all straight, all white, all cis. Mm. There was just no represent representation of most things. And I, it wasn't something that I felt like would be interesting to write about just because I didn't see it anywhere. I feel like the extent of LGBT representation, representation that I saw was like the side character in Perks of Being a Wallflower. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, um, but then as I, grew like with solitaire obviously in solitaire you've got nick and charlie and i really enjoyed writing about them so then in radio silence i brought in more lgbt characters because i found this was something that i really enjoyed writing about and it ended up being really personal to me and it just kind of grew from there and i became more comfortable with it and it became like a part of my writing because mm. i feel like you had a different experience because obviously noah was your first book yeah no can't even was my first book and i think with that there was there was two things I suppose that I was really uh, wanted to do and one was I, I really wanted something that was funny because I felt that I'd read a fair bit of LGBTYA which was and while we need all you know it's important to have all types of stories but I, I had read a lot where tragedy would occur yeah. mm. to to the gay character inevitably at some point in it or he would be dead at the end or whatever so um so i really wanted to show a different side to that and you know we always talk a lot about about readers needing to see themselves in books and mm. i think it's important for british school kids to have their british experience reflected in books as well however glamorous the us <laughs> <laughs> appealing is because i feel like there are people out there who will be like well why do we need a whole anthology? Mm. Why not just, you can have a story in an anthology. Like, who's going to read a whole anthology of the gays, <laughs> of the gays <laughs> stories? <laughs> like, what, what do you think is so important about, like, about having something that is purely about those experiences? Gosh, I mean, I think... Um... I, I always, you know, I always think uh, about the types of, particularly when we're writing YA, you know, mm. the types of teenagers who will hopefully encounter the book and look at it and what it's going to mean to them. And I know that whenever I, for example, go into schools and, and do talks and workshops, you know, uh, and I meet a whole variety and broad spectrum of, of kids, um, 
you know, I think about them when I think about what it's going to mean to them to have all this different type of representation within within the book, actually. And I think, um, you know, because because Proud, you know, does have representation from all sections of the community. Mm. Um, I think that's great because you don't necessarily always get that so easily in full length YA novels mm. necessarily, or it can be harder to 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 kind of sometimes locate those titles. How did they pair you up? Was it like we went to author <coughs> art speed dating? We saw who fit. Like how did, well, how did you guys know? We we no. I believe they did all that mm. in house and made the decisions. I think once yeah. they had all the stories in. I didn't hear for ages uh, who I was going to be drawing for. Um, and I don't know how they decided. No. <laughs> I mean, obviously I had my fingers crossed it might end up being Alice. Yay. Obviously. Um, <laughs> because I think we both quite enjoy writing and illustrating about, you know, soft boys. Indeed. Just happy, <laughs> so... happy love stories. <laughs> I mean, that kind of brings me on to what was the, I guess, like inspiration for you behind what you're writing? Was there any kind of guidance from Juno for anyone else on the team? Or was it just like, go do what you want to do? The guidance was, was fairly general in, in the, you know, the, the book is called Proud and and we're, they were looking at the theme of being proud and, and of pride in, in general. So, um, but within that, you know, we were free to go in whatever direction uh, we wanted to really. So um, I'd been, I'd been mulling over for a little while actually the idea of a story about gay penguins not necessarily centered particularly about the penguins but just about it's something that always um has made me quite quite amused really because it seems that every year almost there's another story in the press about some gay penguins in a zoo if you've got all this fuss going on what happens if you're you know you're trying to kind of come out at the same time as as all this stuff is going on with the penguins how might that make you feel mm. um and how might it kind of influence what you're thinking and what you're going through uh so that's where it sort of came from so when you read the story mm. did you know which part of it you wanted to draw was it kind of quite immediate mm. or are you sort of like mm, this this yeah I'm, I, I'm not i feel like it was quite immediate when i i knew because i'd read the whole thing i read the whole thing just as a reader like trying not to think about the art um and then i went back and read through again like making notes on it thinking what part of it could i draw um because i've never illustrated someone else's story before um and i didn't know kind of how i would do that and what it would look like what my style would look like um but then i think the ending i just had to do the ending um because it's such a happy lovely story i feel like the kiss at the end is just <laughs> that just summarizes the whole thing and the mood of the story so and that would make the most impactful drawing so hmm. yeah yeah, I think you. I think you picked the exact right moment as <laughs> well. I was really pleased when I saw it. And it was that 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 section. It's the perfect, uh, perfect little ending. Really wrapped mm. up, isn't it? It's yeah, beautiful. I, I feel like it's such a like cute. Like I spent the entire time reading that story, just like grinning quietly to myself <laughs> as I was reading it. I mean, have you read any of the other stories in the anthology? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Because it's such a. I don't know. I found it such a a range of stuff. I was like laughing one minute, then I was having mm. a little cry. Yeah. Um, if anyone knows me, not unusual. <laughs> Um, do you feel like what, what do you think about that the range that they have in there and uh, the importance I guess of like m more than just this one kind of gay story or this one kind of vibe for gay stories mm. I think that's kind of the point of mm. it isn't it mm. is the point is to show all these different experiences and yeah. you've got really lovely happy stories like Simon's and you've got stories that are more kind of complex and mm -hmm. about dealing with hard feelings and that's just kind of a summary of all the different things that are going on in the LGBT plus community. Do you remember what your first when you were like YA age I guess what the first kind of like gay character that you saw was or the representation whether mm. it was like a real bad time or whether you were like yes I feel like I've got I see something in this. Mine was definitely Glee um, <laughs> oh, what a, <laughs> what a wild complete. ride <laughs> yeah <laughs> not the best but you know it was there it was a thing so it probably would be tv actually um i'm just trying to think what it was i mean i i think in the first i suppose you know shows like um actually you know things like queer as folk on channel four mm -hmm. way back in the day i was i re remember watching the american version of that when we were doing our GCSEs and pretending yeah. like we were going to revise and then yeah. we just played, like we found some site and like found the American yeah. version and just like yeah. played that when we were like 15 yeah. instead. Oh, I suppose there's a, a beautiful thing, Jonathan Harvey's mm. play, which was made into a film by Channel 4. That's probably one of the first actual uh, things I had 
The one at the end when they're dancing. Yeah. It's a really, really great play, and it's a really cute film, actually. Even now, there's so many, um, like, covers or blurbs will hide the fact that something's about... Like yeah. LGBT characters, yeah. which conveniently this, that wasn't even meant to be a segue, but the the front cover of this book <laughs> could not be more obviously no. gay. So, <laughs> um, I mean, how do? Why do you think that happens? I mean, do you think it's 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 useful in a way to to have those things where people can pick them up and not realise? Or do you think actually we should be having it quite explicitly in? on the covers or on at least in the blurb saying like mm. it's going to be part of the story actually make it part of the yeah the... i i mean i really think it should be in the blurb because the, in the way community at the moment if it specifies in the blurb there are so many people who will go out and find it and buy it um but it's interesting and it's difficult i don't think it's as black and white as that because mm. my books for example have lots of lgbt plus characters but it's not in the blurb and I don't think that's a deliberate thing that my publisher have done. Mm. It's just because my books are not really focused on LGBT plus issues. So it would, you know, it'd be difficult to put it in the blurb that in a way that would make sense. So it's yeah. tricky. I also think as well, there is there is a lot of value in having books that are, are slightly under the gaydar, as it were, and not obviously LGBT, because mm. not all teenagers are either comfortable or able to, for example, buy those books or borrow them from the library. Mm. I, I quite often, well, worryingly often meet um, kids, teenagers, uh, on school visits, and, and they will say to me, um, you know, uh, I'm really sorry I wasn't able to bring any money to buy this book because my dad wouldn't let me, mm. because it's a gay book. Mm. Um, and that's horrible. But, you know, so sometimes uh, I think, you know, for those um, teenagers... It's really important that, that you can have a book that isn't perhaps in your face, mm. you know, LGBT, just so they can take it home or borrow it from the library mm. without fear of any, you know, repercussions mm. from unsympathetic parents mm. or whoever it might be. So it's really difficult. I mean, obviously, it would be great if that wasn't the case, but, you know, sadly, sadly it is. So, mm. but having said that, of course, also really important to have those books out there that are loud and proud and very yeah. clear about what they are and unashamedly so. And that's absolutely right, too. If someone, uh, like, watching this was interested in writing and they're thinking, like, oh, I'd like to include, like, LGBT characters and experiences in there, do you have any advice, any, like, things they should read or look at or any things that you'd mm. kind of wish someone had talked to you about? One thing I would say is... Um, like, just be careful if you're writing an experience that you really know nothing about, research is so important. Like, for example, in my third book, I included a trans protagonist and I did a lot of research around that, sort of listening and reading stuff about trans people and reading books written by trans people. Um, and it just, it teaches you so much and it's just good to approach it the same way you would approach researching anything in a book. So if you're writing a history book, you would go and research stuff about that time period to just make sure you're aware of like things that you could possibly do wrong if you're writing about an experience that you haven't had because i got um a comment the other day on a video that was from someone saying like i'm writing something and mm. there is a character in it who's gay but who isn't in a relationship but i don't know how i don't want to you know like not include their sexuality but i have no mm. idea how to and it's yeah. just and it's interesting it's like if you do that research i think you'd under you start to understand the fact that it isn't just like gay people will say they're gay like that's the thing yeah. that they can mm. do mm. um it's not like we never say it um <laughs> but also you can talk about exits you can talk about mm. people that they fancy they can go yeah. to gay bars yeah. yes of course there are things that are different and and there are things that you would perhaps never think of if you were heterosexual than if you were gay for example like you know kissing your partner in the street might become more of an issue. But you've got to make sure you treat them the same as other characters in that you're giving them a full personality mm. and relationships and a role in the story and don't sacrifice all that just to point out that they're gay. No, yeah. <laughs> they're more than, than their sexuality. That's mm. the thing, isn't it? Otherwise they do just become that sort of gay best friend character. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hilarious and fun. Mm. Well, that's it. But that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say to people who, if we're talking about the kinds of LGBT stories that we tell, who say, for example, coming out stories, we've had enough of those. Surely it's time to talk about something else. We don't need those anymore. Well, I'll tell you for why. Um, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> invariably, I think the people who say that are perhaps a little bit older 
they're normally mm. at least in their 20s or older. And I think actually you shouldn't forget that, you know, when writing YA, your target audience really is, you know, is teenagers or, you know, that's essentially who we're writing about and, and for. Although, of course, lots of people read it, fantastic. But, you know, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact uh, of that demographic. And, you know, when you're 13, 14, 15 or, or whatever, uh, you know, coming out is still a thing it's still it's still quite a big thing for a lot of them of course it is a along with kind of the whole process of working out who they are and how they're feeling and it's uh, confusing and it's complicated and it can be quite scary and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that and I think while there are a number of books that do tackle that there is definitely always room uh, for something new uh, so I say the more the merrier yeah you know? excellent Can you explain a bit about like what your involvement is with it? I didn't actually do the art for this book, kind of. That all came from other poets and writers. I have written an essay, um, the sort of the foreword to the book, which was about how shooketh I am, even now that a book like this can exist mm. and that it can live in school libraries. Yeah. Um, because obviously when I was at school, it would have been illegal for a book like yeah. Proud to be in that library. Um, and really that's what, my, that's what my essay is about. Right from the beginning when I was talking to everyone at Stripes, we kind of came up with a dream team mm. of, I, I was just involved in the authors and poets, um, a dream team of who we'd really love to see in it. And we, we particularly wanted to focus on um, UK talent and UK mm. YA talent. And obviously the caveat was everybody had to belong to the LGBTQ plus community as well. And I'm very pleased to say that everyone we asked said yes pretty much straight away. The only sad part was I could have easily thought of like another 10, 20 people. Yeah. And that was that was really tough. And so what we sort of did, and it was a re really difficult meeting, was we kind of drew up um, 10 people that I desperately wanted to, to take part and that Stripes desperately wanted to take part. And then we also kind of had like a plan b but it, it wasn't a plan b we ever had to use yeah um i mean of course the only answer would be to do proud to revenge of the pride <laughs> and and get all those other authors and poets involved as well you were saying about how like it being illegal which is obviously a reference to section 28 yeah how quickly has especially ya and children's fiction picked up this idea of like actually talking about lgbt identities is important and it's something that we can do do you feel mm. like it's been super recent and like is it kind of increasing um even into the future now I hope so. I mean, I think literature has always been a way to explore some really big ideas. And I think, um, I also think particularly children's and YA can be quite subversive. Mm -hmm. And I think the one I mentioned in my essay is Judy Bloom's Forever, which came out in 1974. There's a gay character, there's an abortion, there's talk of sexually transmitted infections. And that was all in a children's book, yeah. you know, and so much of what we do kind of flies under the radar. Um, I think sort of explicit conversation about LGBTQ youth is a relatively recent thing. I mean, this, David isn't gonna thank me for saying this, but obviously Boy Meets Boy came out in 2003, mm. which does make it 16. Mm. Is that, have I done my maths wow, right? Is that yeah. about 16 yeah. years old? So, I mean, that is now, and I think, you know, Boy Meets Boy, when it came out was quite groundbreaking. Absolutely. And still is, actually. I reread Boy Meets Boy not so long ago and it is still incredibly groundbreaking in that it kind of posits this world where LGBTQ kids can just all live mm. free from harassment. And, you know, in the real world, we're not there yet. Not so much. Not so much. But um, I think in the years that followed um, Boy Meets Boy, we, you know, we've seen LGBTQ plus representation improve there's still stuff to do. I mean, and I think the danger of representation in children's or YA fiction is that people say, oh, we've done it. You know, Knots and Crisis came out around the same time as Boy Meets Boy, and for, and for a long time it felt like, oh, well, you know, there, there's a diverse book. You know, yeah. we've done it, we can call off the search, we, we've ticked <laughs> off diversity. And so, of course, it doesn't really matter what year we find ourselves in. You know, Love, Simon, or um, The Art of Being Normal shouldn't be the only books yeah. about gay kids or trans kids you know we need lots and lots and lots of them do you feel like there are any particular stories or elements or experiences that you really want to see written about next or you want to see more stuff to do with um I mean it's a tricky one because the thing is what I always say is 
and I remember saying this a while back, which is there's a constant call and demand and um, urgency to have representation. But very often it is there. It's just possibly we haven't discovered it yet. And so I think, you know, it would be nice to see more from non-binary identities. It would be nice to see more bisexual characters or pansexual characters. I remember in one of my books, All of the Above, I got some fan mail saying I'd never seen the word asexual in a book before. Mm, yeah. And I was like, that can't be the case. <laughs> it cannot be the case that my book is the first time you've seen the word asexual on the page. And so sometimes... I imagine there is some probably really wonderful representation out there, but it, it might just be a case that I haven't found it yet. But of course the trick is, is to just, and I'd say this, you know, advice for writers out there, just keep, keep on keeping on, you know, and I think what's wonderful about Proud is that, you know, it, it has it all. And that's the wonder of an anthology, which is there's, it's like a tapas tasting menu. There are lots and lots of different characters in there and lots and lots of different types of people being represented. Do you have any advice for people who maybe aren't LGBT themselves, who want to include that kind of like mm -hmm. diversity in their own stories, but are a bit worried about like, where do, where do I start? Yeah. Um, I think representation is everyone's responsibility. I don't think the responsibility to represent minority groups should necessarily fall on people from minorities, because otherwise I will be writing about um, trans girls until the end of time. And, and while I have done that, um, part of my job as an author is to imagine what it would be like to be someone else. You know, that is kind of, it's like, plumbers mend toilets, authors imagine what it's like to be other types of people. So I would encourage writers to explore um, characters who don't necessarily come from the same um, groups that they do. But I think never make assumptions and as well come from similarities before differences. Um, and I think, you know, when particularly thinking I guess, about trans people, you know, I suppose it'd be really easy to think about, right, these are the ways that trans people might be different to cis people. But actually, my life is largely informed by the same things as a cisgender person's life. My likes, you know, we're all looking for love and happiness and warmth and shelter and work and money. And really, I think that's the more interesting angle to start from. But then at the same time, always keeping in mind that a person from a minority group has lived with oppression. There's no other word for it. And, and they will have been oppressed in different ways and sort of to think about, well, what would that be like? Um, what ways have I been oppressed? And can I relate the types of ways that I've been oppressed with the types of ways that a woman or a trans woman or a person of colour might have been oppressed? And how would that oppression have affected me and where and how? And so I think that is a really good thing for somebody doing creative writing to think about. It's, and bear in mind that for you, it's a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. For them, it's a lived experience. Yeah. And really the word that it boils down to is compassion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not just for authors, that's for all of us to try and imagine what life is like for people who aren't us. I think we have to be super mindful that we are not 13 anymore and living in a suburb of West Yorkshire or something you know for those people for those people who haven't come out yet coming out is still a massive life-changing big deal and just because there have been other stories doesn't necessarily mean they speak to that person who is in the suburb of West Yorkshire and you know we do keep needing them to keep them centre stage um and as well there's lots of different ways to come out infinite ways to come out and you know social media has complicated matters as well. So a whole raft of those coming out stories existed in an age where you couldn't come out online publicly to your followers. Um, so I think there is absolutely a place for coming out stories. However, that isn't the only story. And we have to be mindful of that then what? And I'm very interested in then what stories. Yeah. You know, what happens? So you've done the big coming out then what? You have a whole life to live, you know. Being trans or being gay or bi or queer or lesbian is not who you are, you know, it's what you are and, you know, what's going to happen then. And so I think part of the answer to that is to inhabit all kinds of fantasy worlds with queer characters. So we need queer characters in ghost stories, we need mm -hmm. queer characters in historical books, we need queer characters in science fiction. And that way we can see LGBTQ plus characters 
doing stuff mm -hmm. that's not just coming out because once you've come out you've got a whole adventure to have hello it's present Moran again um i hope you enjoyed that i had an absolute blast filming those interviews just blooming loved it um as usual if you like my videos you can subscribe if you fancy, get more of them in your sub box. If you really like my videos and want to help support make them, uh, I'm going to leave a link to my Patreon below along with all my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye! Did you do a lot of penguin research? Were you... Oh my god, <laughs> penguins! Oh. The penguins are so cute though. I mean, they, they're yeah. very cute. I'm glad <laughs> it because really it well. took me so long to work I out how to draw penguins. Draw I'm penguin. so bad at drawing animals. <laughs> <laughs> But penguins, literally, just me scrolling through Google images of penguins, like, nesting on eggs. Like, that was me for, like, an hour. Yeah. yeah. You're just like, you're like, okay, a person, da-da-da-da-da, <laughs> that's done. Oh, no. Penguins. Penguins. Now. <laughs>